Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. Appreciate those of you who are listening on demand. Uh, hopefully, you, some of you have checked us out for our live uh, episodes. We are uh, recording live every Thursday at 1130 Pacific, 230 Eastern. Uh, this is a very special uh, on-demand episode of Sales Pipeline Radio that you're likely finding through our podcast feed at iTunes Store or the uh, Google Play Store. So thank you very much for that. Uh, or potentially from the on-demand library of all past, present, and future episodes at salespipelineradio.com. Very, very excited to have with us here today Byron Matthews. He's the president and CEO of the Miller Hyman Group and also the author of the new book, Sales Enablement, a master framework to engage, equip, and empower a world-class sales force. So, Byron, thanks again so much for joining us today. Matt, I appreciate it. Thank you. So, talk a little bit about you know the. I think I mean you've you've you know, with your role at Miller Hyman. I mean, obviously you you've seen quite the evolution of what's happening in sales mm -hmm. and really the rise in sales and enablement as a function. I feel like even just four years ago or so, like the, the term barely existed, and now all of a sudden, right. I mean, we're seeing like you're. I mean, you you guys are sharing some information on the. It's you know, companies are investing at a rate of twenty six percent more on last year. Fifty nine percent of organizations now have a sales enablement function, um, but there's still a gap there, right? I mean, there's still even though we're seeing a a rise in the understanding and even formality of sales enablement, we're still seeing a gap between that and actually generating results. Talk a little bit about what you're seeing on that front today. Yeah, so I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the it's 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 by far the fastest growing trend I would say in the in the world of selling is this is this emergence of sales enablement, and it's really trying to uh, get after the gap between performance and really, you know, buyers getting better at buying much faster than sellers are getting better at selling. And that gap's increasing in sales enablement is really what's trying to fill that. But a couple things. One is it's happened so fast. I mean, you know, as you said, 60% of organizations have it just a couple of years. That was, that was in half. Um, but it's happened so fast that it's, it's been a bit haphazard. There really hasn't been a lot of structure around what is enablement, how to really do it well, um, you know, how to get value out of it, how to drive value into, inside the sales organization. People are just kind of throwing things at it. There's been a common thread of, you know, services that they go after and kind of how, they're, how they, you know, organize themselves. But at the end of the day, what we're seeing is because it's harder to sell today, because um, buyers have changed so quickly um, and selling traditional selling models are still trying to, Kind of penetrate and, and and work against that changing buyer model. It's it's gotten harder. So, to me, when I think about the greatest sales enablement companies, or I'm sorry, the greatest sales enablement functions, what they do really really well is they're kind of again transforming that that traditional sales model, outside sales model, to what we consider um, kind of the new generation. And that new generation, the biggest difference is how they engage buyers. Um, it's not just about asking questions. It's not just about understanding the needs, albeit that is incredibly important still, but it's about how do you really inspire that buyer? How do you truly add value? How do you really educate them? How do you honestly take control of the buying process? And that requires a level of sophistication from a seller that really enablement is trying to drive. And so the ones that really you know, are getting it right they're, you know, they're, they're going after it through content. You know, how, how do you turn a seller into a content marketer? How do you give them, you know, and, and equip them with data and analytics and insights, real time specific to a customer example? Um, again, the, the, the enablement functions that, that, that truly understand how to do that with speed are the ones that are being successful. Yeah, I agree with that. We're talking today on Sales Pipeline Radio with Byron Matthews, the president and CEO of Miller Hyman. And you know, you've been with Miller Hyman now for about five years, and you were an operational mm -hmm. sales leadership role before that. You know, talk a little mm -hmm. bit about how quickly this has evolved. I mean, w even if we didn't call it sales enablement, I imagine some of these function existed before. And for companies that might not be on maybe the early adopter leading edge of adopting sales enablement, what are some signs from the past, from your past, or signs that companies should be looking for internally that that should tell them that they they need to step up and think about really adopting a formal sales enablement function. Well, actually, you you, you brought up a good point. You know, in in lieu of having sales enablement, it doesn't mean that these things don't still happen. They just happen in silos. So if you think about the core of sales enablement, providing content or 
or technology, you know, sales enablement tools or uh, training services or coaching services. Well, without sales enablement, you know, what was happening before? Well, you know, HR would jump in and, and they would help and that would be, you know, the customer or, or you would have marketing coming in helping with the content or IT would come in. So it was, it was these kind of point solutions, essentially. And it really wasn't, you know, what, what, what sales enablement does is it provides that strategic lens around everything, organizes everything, and it, it directly links it to a plan to better drive additional performance in a sales organization. For me, it was my time at Mercer. I mean, I was you know, kind of head of sales at Mercer. We were driving a large transformation program, and it meant more than one thing. We weren't just putting in, it was the time I got exposed to Miller Hyman, frankly, it, it, what we, we weren't just putting in a methodology for 6,000 people. We weren't just changing some roles or looking at compensation or putting in a new whole coaching program. We actually had to do it together thoughtfully. Um, they all connected to each other. They're all independent in, or, 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 or they, they, I'm sorry, they all had dependencies in terms of when you did one, how it impacted the other. And at that time, I was thinking, wow, you know, this idea of bringing these things together um, was hard. It was actually more difficult because we had the function areas like HR and marketing manager just kind of driving forward. And it was something that I remember thinking, you know, we had to put dedicated people around this to make sure to work on behalf of sales to make sure that it was all orchestrated correctly. But I'll tell you, the, the results were profound. I mean, for me as a sales leader, this is why I'm in the job today and this is why the Miller Hyman's made all the investments that it's made. You know, it was the game changer. I mean, we did all of this right on the heels, right before the economy crashed in 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 08. And and literally our strategy in 09 and 010 was let's just out sell everybody. We just did this large program. We just rolled all this out. We're ready. And, you know, we punched above our weight and we literally grew sales in 09 and grew sales in 10 when our competitors were, you know, minus double digits. And it's because all of this stuff came together at the right time. So that's why I believe in it so much. And that's when I came on board at Miller Hyman. This is why we've made all the investments to kind of reinvent ourselves, you know, much beyond a training company. It's, it's, it's something that we believe deeply in, in terms of, you know, the broad needs of sales organizations today. Well, and you gave some good examples of why sales enablement really is very different than other functions. I mean, it's it's difficult to say, you know, it's a sales function or it's a marketing function. You know, it's not it's not a slam dunk where it's own. I mean, it really, I think sales enablement is is when executed well, it's very cross functional. It requires a level of orchestration across different elements. Talk about how companies do that best. I mean, who who should be the champion or, you know, maybe some organizations, you know, is there a, a is opportunity for someone in the organization to, you know, benefit their the perception of their organization by stepping up and doing this? But then how do you manage that effectively in a cross-functional way? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an excellent point. And you really touched on um, an important aspect of what makes some of these initiatives and organizations work well and when it doesn't. We dedicate a whole chapter around even the, the, the collaboration component of sales enablement. Mean, that alone is so important. So yes, it's cross-functional. It's the only way this works. If you think about sales organization um, as the client of HR or marketing or IT, um, all its different, you know, uh, um, um, functional areas that they need. Sales enablement, again, is the wrapper around it. it. It really works best when it lives inside of sales. It does not work best when it lives inside of sales operations. It's different than sales operations. It's not about comp, territory design, um, or implementing the tools. This is the strategy. This is the, I understand exactly where the needs are of our buyers, how they're evolving, how they're changing, how that works. And then I deeply, deeply understand the capabilities of our sales team, and I am dedicated to solve that gap. And it starts with, and again, some of this is going to sound very traditional, but when companies overlook it, they fail. It starts with understanding and defining my charter, being very clear to everyone in the organization, this is what this gap is, and this is how we're dedicated, how we are dedicated in solving it. And from there, I need 
your help from an IT standpoint. I need your help from a marketing standpoint. I need your help from a HR, whatever it might be. And a roadmap is put in place where very specific needs are addressed at the exact right time that is incredibly transparent. So the best companies will put a steering committee around this. They'll talk about this charter. They'll talk about the roadmap. They'll have metrics around sales performance tied to each one of those milestones. And so everyone understands how they help and when they help. And there's full transparency around the results along the way. Um, it's actually, again, it sounds very kind of not pedestrian, but, oh, that makes a lot of sense. It's actually really hard to do, and it takes a lot of executive sponsorship to buy into this, to carve out the time, to, car to make sure that there's room to operate the discipline required to actually pull something like that off. So let's talk a little bit about the book. I mean, over the last couple of years, we've seen quite a bit of content come out sort of really trying to describe and sort of help create kind a of blueprint for companies to really take advantage of sales enablement. This may be the first time I've seen a, a, a full-sized, a full-fledged book created. Your new book, Sales Enablement, a master framework to engage, equip, and empower a world-class sales force. Talk a little about where this book came to be, how you guys decided to write a book, yeah. and, um, and, and, and how this is different from a lot of the other literature out there on sales enablement. Yeah, thanks for asking. I mean, it, honestly, it started with two years of research. So this was something that we didn't take lightly. It was like, oh, there's a trend. Let's throw a book out. That's actually not what happened. Um, we felt the trend two years ago um, and started doing an annual kind of research study dedicated around sales enablement. So we, we researched 300 companies and really understood who has enablement, who doesn't, what, you know, when they do, are, do they outperform the others? Yes, they do. Okay, this is actually now really important. What do they do? How do they do it? When does it work? When does it not? And so we learned all of this kind of after the first year. And then before we even jumped into writing, we said, okay, well, we need another year of this to really understand, you know, are there anomalies or things like what can we declare as best practice and feel really good about that backed by a couple years worth of research. So then we did the next year, which was last year's research. Um, so 16 and 17. And then when 17 results even empowered the initial 16 results, we knew we were on to something big here. Um, and again, we just, we frenetically could have thrown something together in the beginning of 16, uh, but just didn't feel right about it. But then when we started actually putting pen to paper last year, we just really, really have confidence now about what good looks like, uh, or frankly, what great looks like as it relates to what are the services that really power sales enablement? Because again, when we looked at these companies, you know, there's there really is is you know, lots of people do things very differently. They like some have brought compensation inside of sales enablement. Well, you know, when we really double click on that, that's honestly a, a best practice for sales operations, not enablement. So we really feel confident now about what is and defines sales enablement in terms of success, how to organize it. Like I said dedicating a chapter just around collaboration and how to, you know, work with an across functional team, putting templates in place. You know, we harvested the best of what we thought organizations did in terms of tools and templates and kind of provide all that stuff as part of our, as part of our package in the book. It just took some time, but again, something we feel really proud to stand behind. Love it. So book coming out in May. Uh, we will have links to pre-order that book in the notes for this episode, but definitely check that out. Sales enablement, uh, by our guest today, Byron Matthews. I mean, we're we're still clearly early in the adoption and maturation of sales enablement, but we are far along. I think we're already seeing, um, you know, we're seeing success stories, but we're also seeing some some missteps uh, when it comes mm -hmm. to companies executing sales enablement. What are some of the common reasons why people stumble out of the gate or stumble in in executing uh, sales enablement programs that that our listeners can maybe watch for and try to avoid? Yeah, I mean, there's some common sense stuff, but not always common practice. So I'm going to say some things that you're like, okay, makes sense, but then people just don't do it. So here's an example. Um, I kind of alluded to this before. When it's very frenetic, when people hire a sales enablement director or someone responsible for sales enablement with maybe a, you know, a few resources around it, but with no clear charter, with no clear path, it just says, it's almost like the, the old kind of sales effectiveness roles that lived out there where it was just make us better or, you know, we just need to improve sales. It's, it's, it goes back to the fundamentals that are missed up in, in the beginning, which is sales enablement teams 
have to be so passionate and so dedicated to learn two very, very important things. One, what are the real and honest buying processes today? How do our buyers behave today? What is unique about them? How, you know, what, is, what are some of the common threads? What are the needs that they have? And then second, what truly are the capabilities of my sales organization? And understanding that gap is everything. That provides the roadmap necessary to then define and declare the role. And once, organ once people, you know, human beings that actually are in these roles can do that well, it's gold because they can now walk into any room, any executive, and talk about how to get to greatness and what the gaps are and what's preventing us from breaking through whatever it might be. Or even if they're in growth mode where they're doing really well, it's here's how we can get to the next gear. Um, and so without that understanding, they oftentimes fail. They get way, they jump way too tactical, way too soon. And uh, that's probably the biggest issue that I see in terms of um, some of the effectiveness that kind of lost their way in terms of a real powerful story and a purpose. Um, and then again, I, I, I would argue there's a bit of a, uh, courage aspect to it, corporate courage sometimes gets in the way in the sense where the ones that even do kind of figure out what's going on, you got to take the courage to, to make, to drive change. I mean, sales organizations must be agile today. That's a fact. Buying, buy, uh, uh, buyers are incredibly innovative. They're moving fast. They're changing quickly. Now, I get it. It's, it's easy for them to change. It's harder for sales organizations to change. That's a big decision to make. The reality is because buyers have innovated much faster, they get much. They have much more data at their, at, 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 in their hands. They're able to make decisions quicker. They're able to um, shut out salespeople much further along than they used to. Um, the, the, the truth is that this uh, sales organization, they need to change fast too. And so sale, uh, sales enablement is, in, is empowered to do that. When they don't do that, when they're way too tactical, I think they oftentimes miss it. Wrapping up here with uh, Byron Matthews, President and CEO of Miller Hyman. Definitely check out his new book, Sales Enablement. Uh, it's coming out in May. Uh, last question I want to ask you: We ask a lot of our guests is, you know, as you've kind of got kind of grown in your your sales and leadership career, who are some of the people that you learn the most from? They can be authors, speakers. They can be dead or alive. Who are some of the biggest inspirations that have in your career and growth that you'd recommend other people checking out as well? Well, honestly, uh, you know, for me, uh, is the thing that surprised you, but Bob Miller was was quite inspirational um, mm -hmm. in terms of I've had a chance to. When I uh, became CEO, he was uh, still kind of connected to our business, but we, you know, he, he 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 would go to some of our client events and just I mean, he really, if you think about solution selling as a concept, you know, uh, needs based selling, consultative selling, I'd argue he was the pioneer. Um, of that. And so he, he was somebody that I really just enjoyed listening to and learning from. Um, other than that, I'll tell you, I mean, obviously, you know, Neil Rackham was a, was a big uh, chance to get to know him a bit um, in terms of just the pure science. I mean, I think he was one of the pioneers of just really putting science inside of sales uh, in a very, very you know, early on when, when 95% of everybody made that up. But Arguably, vast majority of everybody believes sales was just an art. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then the people that that you don't know that just you know, to me, great sellers. When you really get to know somebody who's just an amazing seller, you can learn so much from them in terms of how they process things and how they think. And I've got a long list of those folks. Awesome. All right. So uh, I, I said that was the last question. I do have one more question: Cubs or Sox? Yeah. Cubs for sure. All right. That's good. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. No, that's the right answer. Uh, that's that's totally fine. Okay, I guess my follow-up would be like, what's wrong with the Cubs? It's mid it's mid April, and maybe it's just the cold. But and this looked like a little like last year. But um, and as a as a Cubs fan myself, I'm a little worried. It's they're just they're still stuck in the winter. It's too cold here. Once they once it turns warm and they feel like it's baseball season, they'll kick it in. 
Yeah, I would agree. I think, um, you know, I think, you know, it still still bears weather in Chicago right now. I think I saw the wind chill is like 20 exactly. degrees and that, that's not conducive for hitting or catching or any kind of the regular baseball activity. So it'll no get better. Sir. The weather's going to warm up. Wrigley's going to be beautiful. The Cubs are going to win and we're going to sing Go Cubs Go a lot more this summer. But uh, until we do, thank you so much again to our guest uh, for joining us today, Byron Matthews, CEO, president of Miller Hyman. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on this special episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. Make sure you check uh, check out his new book, Sales Enablement. Check that out on Amazon. We'll put a link in the notes for this podcast. And we'll look forward to seeing you again on a future episode of Sales Pipeline Radio.